What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. Go to rise25.com, learn more. It's run by myself, co-founder John Corcoran. It is application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Michael Terrell, founder of Whole Tones. Whole Tones differentiates itself from traditional music therapy with its unique use of specific frequencies other than 440 hertz, which I'm going to have Michael explain further. Michael is a musician, composer, producer. He's even won a Grammy Award for his work with Mylon Lef. Lefevre? How do you pronounce it? You got it. Lefevre. He's author of the book, Whole Tones, The Sound of Healing. Michael, I'm excited to have you. Thank you for joining me. It's an honor, Jeremy. I've been looking forward to it. So I want to start off with just talking about the differences between traditional and your CDs. You have seven CD, Whole Tones CDs, right? Well, we have substantially more product now, but yes, the original one is a seven CD set, yeah. correct? Yeah, so what's the difference between traditional, for people who don't know what frequency, whole tones? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, the best way to explain it would be um, we're used to hearing music in a particular frequency range in the United States of America, more or less. You know, there's always people that take liberty with tuning here and there, but by and large, if you go to a music store, you'll get a tuner and it will be calibrated to the, the note A equals 440 hertz. Hmm. As a child, I always knew there was something wrong with music. Obviously, a whole lot right with it, or I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have put my whole life into it. But right. I always knew that someday I'd figure out what it was that was bothering me. And at the end of the day, I realized after 20 years of research that the tuning center of A equals 440 hertz was um, negative to how we're created, especially when it comes to our electricity, circadian rhythm, how we sleep, how we wake, uh, and through a very clandestine meeting in Israel, which I'm sure we'll get to at some point. Uh, yeah, this I, was a Jewish Orthodox coffee, coffee house. house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I ran into That's a guy. That's the most random thing when I read that. I'm like, okay. But you know, some of the greatest things in the world, at least in my life, I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of an X-Files guy, but I've always run into amazing <laughs> things. Even right. Joe Barton, the, the uh, publisher, my publisher, we just ran into each other, but literally, um, well, I want to make sure I answer your question first before we go to Israel. But um, I just realized after a lot of research that music in its own right, you know, the old maxim that uh, music soothes the savage beast. I realized that that was possible, but there's also attachments, i.e. in other countries, they don't use the tuning that we use. And most people would not know that. You wouldn't realize that if you took your tuner and put it in your suitcase and went to South America and wanted to tune up and play with the band, it would be impossible because they tune to a different frequency than we do. Hmm. And that happens all over the world. Um, so my pursuit was finding out what frequency would adhere to the body and, and on a cellular level actually bring some sort of, of uh, stability, if you will, to the human body as opposed to something that's always fighting against how we're designed electronically. So that was the impetus behind... Uh, whole Tones was, uh, like I said, a clandestine meeting that kind of turned the lights on. And then I realized how deep the rabbit hole was and spent, you know, between 18 and 20 years researching it before I ever even recorded. So let's talk about one of the examples and how you came to one of these. Because I see on the site, there's like a 396 hertz, yes. 417, 444. Which one can we talk about and explain like how you came to that specific frequency? Well, we can. And and 396 hertz, which, which for your listeners, it's really simple. Like it sounds so, for, I mean, 10 years from now, it's going to be like table talk. But now it sounds like so heady. It's not heady. Um, 396 hertz or hertz in itself is just named after Dr. Hertz that invented that measurement of basically what we're looking at is 
vibrations per second. Right. So 396 hertz is just that. It a a given instrument string, uh, what, whatever vibrates 367, you know, 396 times per second. Right. So that is what we call on my project the open door, and yeah. for good reason. Um, when you work with vibratory uh, stimulus or or you work with frequency uh, on the human body, a lot of times because we're all plus minus, there's commonalities. A lot of people are insecure, they're ashamed, they deal with bitterness or they deal with stuff and they don't really feel worthy to receive healing in the first place. I know that sounds crazy, but one of the components of 390, 396 hertz is it causes the body to relax long enough to get into a state of realizing, wow, I can, I can get better from this. It opens the person up to receive more. So. If we were using like a laser probe or some other type of device to, to introduce that frequency, the same frequency to the body, they would call it the opening frequency instead of the open door, which I've named mine, because what it will do is that frequency will open the human body up enough to receive the other impulses that are coming later on. And that's kind of why 396 is the open door is because I always recommend, no matter what people do, always make sure you include that in your daily regime. Listen to that one first. How did you figure out there was 396? I'm curious. Like, okay, as opposed to, because there's a different, it's very precise, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it in this term, you know, a couple things to demystify it, and then I'll answer the question, hopefully, in the, in the way that it will help. Um, we have to demystify something off the bat for your listeners. Um, frequency in itself is everything this conversation the modality that we are connected right now by computer via skype uh the microphone in front of your face the words we're exchanging what we're hearing how it's broken down everything's a frequency everything has a resonant frequency and so you would say oh that still sounds heady until i said well hey jer what if i would have met you 45 years ago and i came over to your house with a big aluminum rectangular box and i said don't worry I'm not going to trash your kitchen, but I'm going to cut a rectangular hole in the sheetrock and I'm going to put my box in it. But when I'm done, no matter what you want to do, tea, coffee, food, you can heat it up in there and you can take it out with your bare hands and it won't be hot to the touch, but it'll be piping hot. You go, that guy's out of his mind. Well, all those are specific frequencies that cause what? Water molecules to get excited. Molecules and food to get excited, and then they get excited, and then they start rubbing on each other, and friction starts, heat starts, and energy <laughs> is dispersed through it. It's right. that simple. Your favorite radio station growing up in a kid, mine was 96 Rock. And so, as long as that, that dial was on 96 Rock, I got Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers coming at me. But the moment that that analog dial gets off just a little bit, well, we have no more signal, we have noise. Same way with frequencies. The reason they're specific is because they're centered upon certain parts of the human body. Right. Certain parts of your body will resonate. Everybody's body will resonate. If I say right now, I love you, and it's real, then all your listeners just felt what I, I just said. In the same way, if you said, I hate you, and you meant what you said, they would feel that in a different way, in a negative way. Right. So to try to answer your question as easily and to demystify all this instead of frou-frou as being great science, um, 396, uh, if you'll notice, if you look across at all of the frequencies, all of them are mathematically connected. They're all sulfagy tones, and sulfagy, to demystify that, simply means to sight sing. And, and in the ancient sulfagy style of King David, all the way up until late 540s, um, there was no polyphony or no chordal music. Everything was just melodic content. And, and fathers would teach their sons these particular frequencies or test tones, and they would, you know, they would, that's where their music would imbue. They, they would learn these songs and then they would sing together in unison, later on becoming Gregorian chant, as we know, and blah, blah, blah. But these sol sulfagy tones are ancient tones. It wasn't like, you know, scientists might discover these in a test tube. This was going on, I don't even really know how far back we could trace it, Early Egypt, early Israel, we know for sure. Um, so these particular frequencies, when you take their harmonic um, mathematical components, it was pretty quick to derive certain other frequencies that were familiar or in the same family of that one. And once you do that, um, I had the blessing of being able to work um, with a physicist and some other people that are actually just friends of mine, 
go figure. And, and um, there is actually specific resonant points of your organs, your lungs, your heart. You know, and you say right away, or, or, or a critic would say, yeah, but my heart's not the same as your heart. You're absolutely right. My lungs are bigger than your lungs. You might be right. What about my liver? What about my gallbladder? Well, there's always a baseline for every organ. Meaning, if let's say, let's just throw out the terminology 741 hertz and say that it affects, you know, this part of your heart, let's say. Now, let's say your, your heart weighs, I don't know, eight pounds. Mine weighs 7.4, whatever. Ever. So you go, all right, so an eight pound heart must resonate at that frequency, but what about yours? It doesn't weigh that much. That's where oscillation comes in. What's oscillation? Simple. You ever listen to a singer and they just sing one note or they sing, you hear the vibrato? When the vibrato comes in, it's an oscillation and it sweeps that frequency over, over a, a larger band and, and in essence, touching a whole lot more of the same commonality because it's it's sending that frequency through this instead of just this. So I'm giving you a little bit of quick science, but it really, it really isn't that mystical. The point is 396 is a specific frequency, as is 417, 444, um, all the way through you know, 528, 639, 741, and 852. But if you break them all down, if you remember Nikola Tesla's great, he said, if you could understand the mystery behind the three, six, and nine, you would understand uh, how the universe was, the architecture of the universe. Um, all of these are either three, six, or nine. If you break them down in the, you know, in the, mm. in the skein of Pythagoras, they all break down to that same. So they're all related, um, and all of them have a specific tone center that would cause a different part of your body to, to hopefully resonate. Interesting. Make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> as much as like, it can make sense right now for me, but... <laughs> But um, what I found interesting is you – I don't know if this was a mentor or a doctor. He showed you um, some water molecules. Yes. And so tell me about what happened and what was, what was going sure. on at the time. I'd be happy to. Well, interestingly enough, uh, I, was de I was on a missions trip and I came back and I had some kind of nasty liver fluke and the doctors couldn't figure out what it was. So that – you know, that's why some things happen and, and they're negative in your mind and you think – What's this all about? But that drove me to this guy, which I can't mention his name. <laughs> He's kind of a little bit under the radar. That's okay. Everybody would be on his doorstep. Uh, but anyway, uh, I met his nurse at a health food store, and we were talking. She goes, well, you need to come. I think I call him Dr. Jake in the book. You need to come to you know visit his office. Well, when I went to his office, his office wasn't an office. It was a whole wing in a hospital. Hmm. <laughs> so when I went in there, the, the initial thing was, I mean, this guy was, I love people like this because you could tell that he was kind of a, a recluse, but just brilliant guy who wasn't trying to blow his own horn or anything. It was a miracle I got in there. But when I looked in there, he had a giant Tesla coil with a chair in it. And I thought, <laughs> that just doesn't even look safe. And so I went to talk to him about that. And he totally ignored my question. He wouldn't even talk. He wouldn't answer my question. So I thought, I guess he doesn't want to talk about that thing. And he goes, no, come here. I got something else I want to show you. So we had a dark field uh, microscope that had a uh, like a, a pickup if uh, for your listeners um, a uh, an element that brings a vibratory response from the human voice. It was on the bottom of the slide channel. So he said, "I want you to do something for me." I said, "Okay." He said, "I want you to look into the uh, into the eyepiece of of this." It was a dark field microscope into this micro microscope and when i put this water on the slide i want you to tell this the the water how beautiful it is i said i'm not gonna talk to water because i wasn't i wasn't at the place i'm at now i didn't understand you know i was ignorant and he goes all right then you just keep watching and i'll talk to it for you and so he put the drop he said my what a lovely drop of water you are and <laughs> there's this perfect perfect crystal beautiful looks like a, it looked like a snowflake and I went, come on. So he took this it's magic slide. water. Yeah. yeah. He took the slide. That's what I was thinking. This is like some kind of dog and pony. And he flicks the water off, puts the slide back in. And he goes, keep watching, does the same thing again. So he said, now, as awesome as that is, watch this. So he puts it on. And he says, you're just beautiful. And he goes, you suck. The thing shattered like glass like somebody threw a rock at it and he's not saying anything but in my heart i'm hearing 
the power of life and death is in the tongue. Mm. It just demonstrated it in real time that how we speak and the vibratory, how our words vibrate and how the intention behind them, what we would call in science is amplitude, the power behind it. We can do amazing things or we can do horrible things with frequencies. I remember, um, and I don't, I saw it a while ago, but there's a documentary sort of about this, What the Bleep. I don't know if you saw yes. it. Yes. Right? This is about the same concept, right? To some degree it is. It, it, yeah, because, you know, people have a really hard time with, um, with quantum physics, you know. But the way I grew up, it, quantum physics seemed more normal to me than Newtonian physics, you know. But everybody's different. But to me, that made a whole lot more sense about how quarks relate to each person that would be looking at them versus this randomized, you know, oh, yeah, great, an apple fell off a fence post and hit the ground. Gee, Copernicus. I mean, that just didn't do anything for me. But the other one did because it, it presupposes the fact that someone possesses either A, faith, or B, some electronic impulse that changes how that quirk responds to the different humans when they would walk in so that excites me. I mean, that whole type of, but yeah, I mean, I believe that over, you know, I'm 57 now and, and, and I remember, you know, as a young guy, you know, you'd get a car that, you know, and you'd go, what a piece of junk. And you know what? You have the repair bills to prove it. It would be what you said that it was. And I started, you really, know, and I used to just snicker too. I mean, I look at stuff and I go, well, that's just silly. But then I just started speaking life into things. And same with my mailbox. I started calling it the money box instead of the bill box. I used to always, oh, I ever get his bills. And I started calling it the money box and I stopped getting so many bills and things started changing and people started contacting me. And so I just realized there is intention with, with goodness. A lot of what happens, um, I mean, can you imagine what our world would be like if people just organically loved each other and didn't get into all of the, you know, the crap, pseudoscience, politics, uh, religious stuff, or they just love people because we're all trying to survive on the planet together? How awesome it would be? We'll start with this interview, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, <laughs> Michael, so what? why did you land in Orthodox Jewish coffee house? Now, that's the great question. So my friend, uh, and I can tell you his name, Dr. Finto, Dr. Don Finto, uh, was my pastor for years at a church I attended in Nashville, Tennessee, Belmont Church. And he saw pretty early on my affinity for the things of um, uh, just, I love not only the tradition, and, but I, I love Jewish people. I, I always have. I feel, I just feel like, I feel like I'm one. And uh, so he said, listen, I just wrote this book called Your People Shall Be My People, and I need you to proofread it for me. But he goes, my payment is I want to take you with me to Israel, and then you can do it over there. And I was like, oh, come on. So, so yeah, I went with him. He was 71 at that time and could still beat me arm wrestling. Crazy <laughs> guy. Just awesome guy. And uh, so anyway, we're uh, at Ben Gurion Airport, and I said, well, should we get, like, GPS or something? He goes, oh, heavens, no. He said, we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants and see where God takes us. And I thought, well, that's exciting because I don't have any sense of direction, and I'm driving. So <laughs> <laughs> so I'm driving this rental car with Don, and he said, I just have this sense we're supposed to go to Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem, and there's this old coffee house. And he said, uh, one of my friends that lives in Tel Aviv um, doesn't know that we're here, but I feel like he's going to show up at four o'clock. So we need to get over there. And I'm just looking at this guy like, I have never had an afternoon like this. I love this. This is Huck Finn, you know? So I did what he said. We drove the coffee house, sat down. When I sat down, um, there was a guy in the corner playing piano. And as soon as we sat down, he looked over at me and he just started like staring at me. And it was like really unnerving, right? That would freak and, me um, out a little bit, yeah. yeah. Well, it was like, take a picture. It lasts longer. It was just bizarre. And uh, and then he was like smirking and stuff. So I'm thinking, what is this guy? What's his gig, you know? And Or, or maybe he thought I was Paisan because I had long hair, like way long hair. And yeah, another musician, you know, in this coffee house. So anyway, so we're sitting there. And at the end, the guy comes up and says, so uh, are you guys Christians? It's like, well... Yeah, since you asked the question, yeah. And he goes, I knew it. I knew it. He goes, did you know what I was doing? And I said, no, what were you doing? And he goes, you didn't recognize the songs? I said, well, I did recognize you were playing like, you know, typical 
historical worship songs that we would know in the States. He goes, yeah, but it's instrumental. He goes, this is an Orthodox coffee house. They'd kill me if they knew what I was doing, but they loved the music. So I like, I really like this guy right off the bat. I said, what's your name? He goes, David. I said, hmm, okay. And he said, I got something for you. And he said, I, I want to give you my whole life's work. And that, like, I, in my life, I can remember a few statements that were made to me where it hit me inside like a ton of bricks. And when he said that, you know, it was like this aloof conversation. It got real serious. He said, I want to give you my whole life's work. I've taken it as far as I can go. And he goes, but you got to wait for my next break. I got to get it out of the car. And I said, okay, so I'll wait. And he went back and started playing. And right around four o'clock, I see Don kind of look over to his left and stand up with his arms out, you know, and he goes, there he is right on time. So some guy named Ruben Duran that didn't know we were in Israel that lives in Tel Aviv shows up at two minutes to four. Don said he'll be there around four o'clock. He had no idea, no way to contact him. And this guy's walking through the door and I'm sitting here going, what the heck's going on? So they're hugging each other. And uh, Don said, well, you know, when you're done with talking to David, we'll go get some food with Reuben and talk for a while and check into the Christian quarter and whatever. So uh, David goes out to his car, comes back and gives me two sets of manuscripts and told me that his whole wheelhouse was David's life and the Psalms and that he interpreted the Psalms. And so there was typical tablature music that we'd all be familiar with to some degree, you know, that has chord changes and whatnot on it, and, uh, some melody. And then there was some, it just, uh, to be quite honest with you, it looks kind of like gibberish to me. I mean, it just looked like a bunch of intervals, like intervolic, like hot, I low, no, and there was a tone center, but it wasn't like any music I'd ever seen before. And I said, okay, cool. So I hugged him, put it in my bag, and that was it. Uh, had a great night with Reuben, laughing about how he just decided to come to Jerusalem, not having any idea we were there, and going to the same coffee house and talking a little bit about this David guy. And so when I got back to the States, I played the tablature stuff, and remember, I would still be tuned to A equals 440. I didn't know anything yet. I wasn't at that place where it had become an aha thing. And I was like, man, eh, that's nice, but that didn't butter my corn. And I just put everything into my file cabinet in the office and walked away and went back to life for two years. Didn't even think about it. And then one day, I don't know what was going on, Jer, but I had this feeling all of a sudden that that I had misinterpreted the music so i took the tablature out and i looked at it and i thought nah that's what it is it is what it is and then i looked at the other one and i went hold on a second this is more relative and i started thinking about the tuning center and then it was really funny because it's like one of those things where where stuff happens and people either think okay he's one of those weirdos that listens to voices i'm not <laughs> i, I, I assure you that but but i had the sensation that i was supposed to open the bible just ad hoc you know and i did and i landed on page 222 and i said if i read the bottom of this page and it talks about david i'm gonna lose my skin right now and right at the bottom it's like and and david the son of jacob and i'm like what it can't be this easy just double it just double it really and i'm talking to there's no one there, but I'm talking to them. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. So I double this, right? Because I know what 222 means. It means God's sufficiency in the midst of man's insufficiency. So I double this, and it gives me 444. Are you kidding me? So the tone center is A equals 444 hertz? That's going to make all the difference? Well, when I got, see how I got this, which was your original question, sorry. <laughs> um, when I got the A equals 444, that was my tuning center. Like instead of A440, it was A444. Now, when I broke that down, all of those other frequencies were right there. So I was like, oh, come on, man. Because that's just... the, the key to David's CD, right? The 444. That's correct. That's correct. So what is that supposed... I mean, we can't make health claims, but what is, um, what is it supposed to help people do without making uh, health claims? <laughs> boy, that's, that's not going to be easy. Um, well... For the what sake was the original of idea? I mean, what was the original idea behind creating that particular CD? That's because you said that's the kind of the foundation. 
Yeah, that was the centerpiece. But what I'm saying is all it's like it's like six degrees from Kevin Bacon. Everything's related to that. Mm -hmm. So if you go the other direction, so you started you know, with that. That was like this the center. Yeah, yeah, point. That yeah. was only because I retuned my guitar when I, I saw that the other set of music. When I said I think I had greatly misinterpreted the music, I was absolutely correct. So when I tuned my guitar to this random tuning of 444 hertz, which was A now, it changes the whole tuning center up four cents. And hence my original statement is like somebody say, well, what could four cents do? Well, in this case, what will four cents on your radio dial do? It's that specific. So right. four cents was, was, even though it's still in the note A, it's four cents higher and it changed the tuning center. So we're now all the other notes like G, for example, is now 396 hertz, which happened to align with the human body. So it was kind of like, again, I, I stumble into a lot. Most most people that, that I, Nikola Tesla, probably my number one fave, but everybody stumbles into this stuff. Anyone, I've never met anyone who was really that intelligent where it was 100% intentional. You know, you kind of like just follow an impulse and uh, next thing you know, you end up with something. I didn't realize how powerful this was going to be until there was certain elements that, that were in my personal realm, like my mother and the deals, you know, her sickness, my dog, which was her fear of, of loud noises, uh, thunder, lightning, fireworks. And, and one day I just happened to be playing the music in the living room and there was, we were having a hellacious storm, which Florida is notorious for in the summer. And she went, instead of freaking out and shaking, she went and curled up in her, in her bed and went to sleep. And I thought, mm. I didn't, but I didn't even do that. I was like, huh, wow, that's not bugging her today. Then I realized that this 396, one thing I can say about that frequency is it has an uncanny, um, pretty much across the board ability to bring dogs in a place of complete uh, composure. Hmm. Um, faster than a thunder suit or anything else when, it, when there's bad thunder lightning. Or if you have a dog that has like separation anxiety and when you leave to go to work, the dog goes nuts. And then when you come home, goes nuts. We just leave this on, and when we come home, you know, she's like, ah, and when, we, when we get back home, ah, because for whatever reason, that frequency helps dogs relax. So it's not just people. It's any living thing. So, Michael, how sensitive are you to other people? You know, like, when you, sometimes you meet someone, you got to get a feel for them, <laughs> um, because this is what you do for a living. I'm yes. curious. That's such a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I can say hypersensitive. I would say like um, even intentions. Like I remember something. I saw someone. On, I won't tell you who it is. I saw somebody on television one time. And I looked over at my wife and I said, "That's a very bad man." Well, later on, he ended up being uh, arrested and put in jail, and everybody would know who it is. I'm not going to tell you who he is, but um, like so, so to the point where. Like doing interviews. If I could climb through the screen and hug you right now, I would do that because whatever it is about you, yes. But I, you know, when you're around just a myriad of people all of the time, um, there's sometimes like I mentioned it in the book, um, resonant frequency. Okay, have you ever heard somebody say, uh, "I feel you, dude," or "I resonate with that," or what? Really, that's in essence what's happening. It's a limbic connection, and people don't really understand how all of that works, but it's as simple as the intuitive nature of the person knows when somebody is receiving love. The fastest, best explanation was the Beach Boys, good vibrations. Right, yeah. <laughs> Remember? Yeah. Yeah. One's sending, the other one's receiving. He has excitement. Expectations. She's she's digging what I'm dishing out, man. You know, good vibes, right? And so, with with that being said, to answer your question, hypersensitive to that, which also goes hand in hand with uh, with discernment and making good decisions and business decisions. Like my publisher, there's a million publishers, but there's only one Joe Barton. Joe's like one of my best friends in the whole world. And so, if you find somebody like that, you can't fail. If you're on the same wavelength, you know, but most, most people, I got to be honest, most people I run into are, 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 are altruistic and actually really good folk. There's just a few nefarious ones. And, and when I am around those people, I get away from them pretty quick. I just, not that I'm afraid that what they have is going to get on me. It's just, I don't even want any of that. I'm mm -hmm. not buying. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you meet Joe? 
So, because I, you know, yeah. obviously you're the creative producer. You could probably pump out these, yeah, you yeah. know, these healing frequencies um, all day long. And then you have yeah. the other side of things, which is the marketing business side, which you've had to do all along too. But then you meet Joe. So, how did you meet Joe? Okay. Um, super funny story. Um, Joe is what an extraordinary man. That's all I can say. Great father. He had a bunch of kids. Um, so a church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota said, hey, we'd like to have you come do this weekend thing, you know, and, you know, do some worship music and play some of your tunes and explain whole tones, you know, the whole idea behind it. And so Joe opened up his house to have the meeting, but Joe was out of town. I thought that was extraordinary. He doesn't know me at all and has no problem having, you know, some itinerant minister guys show up at his house, stay at his house. You know, and so he got in the second day of this three day thing and uh, he was sitting on the couch and I liked him right away. But I started talking and while I was talking, tears are coming down his eyes. Hmm. I mean, just like a constant. And after he says, I've never heard anything like that in my entire life. And I said, wow. I said, I hope that's a positive thing. He goes, no, it's a life altering thing. He said, I think we're going to be really good friends. And so hmm. um, what were you saying? We, well, I was talking about a lot of what we're talking about oh. as far as equating frequencies. Mm, got you know, it. Like a lot of times people don't understand in the terminology like we're speaking. They don't see words or thoughts as frequency. See, they don't. And, and, and rightly so. But, you know, it's like it's like Neo. When he finally saw through the Matrix, he saw everything the way it was. And that's kind of I'm a weird dude. man. And it's kind of like if did you see the movie Tomorrowland by any chance? Mm -mm. You should. <laughs> who wow. Was, who was in that? George Clooney. Uh, it was a Disney film that was... I love from, Disney films. I can't believe oh I haven't God. seen that one. <laughs> oh, God. It's so good that I can't even put it into words. I, I've already watched it like 30 times. But there, It's the on girl, my list now. Thank you. Yeah. You'll love it. And then we'll talk about it. But the girl that's, that, that uh, is kind of like the, the star of the, the thing, she makes a statement and he says... But you don't have the street cred. You don't have the education. You know, who do you think you are? And she goes, I'm just somebody that knows how, how things work. And then it was like, bingo. I just know how everything works. I don't know how I know how everything works. But when I apply it to science, it, it holds water. And all my friends that are around me, thank the Lord, are extreme scientists. And so when I brought whole tones out, um, I had quite a, a litany of people to hand it to and, you know, <laughs> you know, what do you think? And it was like, you have no idea what you've done. I said, you're, you're pretty much 20% correct. I really don't know what, and, and here's the funny part here. I'm still finding out every day. We have 10, maybe a hundred thousand testimonials that and I just sit there and I went, I never would have thought of that plants growing off the hook. A guy named Jordan Rubin. I don't know if you ever heard of Jordan Rubin. He's uh, He's like the supplement guy. Yeah, yeah. Right? He Garden started of Garden of Life. Yeah. And yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. He, he's a very good friend. He was the first guy to use. Um, I have a product called Chroma, which is not only audio, but it's also the corresponding light frequencies as well, and it's on DVD and Blu-ray. And he was the first one. He got the prototypes to put in his hydroponic in his Mycobacterium labs, his indoor growing fields, mm. and it makes plants grow like crazy. So you know, you just sit there, and that's what I mean. I'm finding out every day more applications i made it because i felt like it was you know did you ever they asked mel gibson one time they said why did you make the passion of the christ and he said because i felt like it was the mandate of my life and my wife who is very i married the right person 30 years ago this summer and uh Congratulations. She, thank you bro for her. No. yeah <laughs> for you i mean <laughs> she's a saint yeah. but um but you know it's like if you marry the right person, they don't buy your press. It would, when you know you come back from a conference and people are freaking out, and she goes, "Yeah, but don't forget to take out the trash." She keeps you grounded, right? Yeah. But when she told me when she heard whole tones, like when we were driving back from Dallas to Florida where I recorded, and she heard like the first five minutes of, I looked over at her, and she's not that emotional kind of component. She's more of an admin type. She's completely undone. I mean, just losing it. She looked at me and she said. This is your magnum opus. This is the reason you were created. And when she said that, there was a validity in my heart that I can't, I can't put into words. I can't, I can't, I can't um, 
I, I can't say enough about or articulate how deeply that hit me when she said that. Because, I mean, usually I'll write a song and go, isn't that the best song ever? She goes, nah, it's not that good. But when she heard this, I said, what do you think? And she said, this is it. This is why you're here. This is why God gave you breath. And, and I am so honored that in 84 nations, people feel the same way. So I'm shocked still so take me back to joe joe's yes. getting emotional at yes. the time and so what happened from there okay well at that point there wasn't any he didn't have the full understanding of what i had been working on joe is a master marketer right i mean yes he's... and many other things but yes. yeah yeah he is he, he is and um and and we'll get to that if we have time you'll, yeah. you'll giggle it's funny but um you know he said listen if do you write as good as you talk? And I said, well, I said, no one ever asked me that, but I would assume I write pretty well. And he goes, well, why don't you start writing for my magazine? I have this magazine that's called Home Cures That Work. So I started writing every month for Home Cures That Work, and it kind of blew up a little bit. He goes, people love the way you talk. They love the honesty. And so I wrote for him for a while. I'll, I'll tell you the whole story real quick because it yeah. won't take that long. We, yeah. we just became really close friends and started doing stuff together. And he started taking me and all these these guys like the Mavericks, you know, these guys that have like gazillions of dollars and like ClickBank guys and all these famous guys. And here's this musician guy. And they, but they loved having me around. So it's like, okay, that's well, kind of like a party favor. And, uh, <laughs> and so we did this for, you know, a year, year and a half, just goofed around, spent time together, which it was really the way to do it. Like, cause I'm relational. It's like, we built a heck of a friendship, our families, children, kids love me. We love them. My wife and I love this family. And, uh, so Joe says, hey, uh, I want to take you to this Maverick meeting in New Orleans. So I thought, okay. So my flight was supposed to get in at 1245. It didn't get in until like 845 that night. There was like, there was like four um, mechanicals and all kinds of issues. And I was like, done. When I got there, I just wanted to get into my hotel and go to bed. It was a frustrating day. And, and uh, so I called Joe and found out it's the first night of Mardi Gras. So there's no taxis either. So I'm stuck at the airport. And I called Joe and I... I said, I am so sorry I missed dinner and everything and all your pals. I said, but here's what's happening. And he goes, well, I'm in a taxi right now. I'll come get you. So he comes and gets me. And when he opened the door, we looked at each other. We both started, we started laughing so hard. We laughed for like 30 minutes. He goes, get in the cab. So we got back. We still had time to meet for a late, late dinner with another group of uh, entrepreneur people. But anyway, so the next morning, this is where it got fun. We get up early, get dressed. We're going to go down and go to the Maverick meeting. And Joe looks at me and goes, do you want to go to that meeting? And I said, what? Do you feel like it? And I said, Joe, you invited me to go to this meeting from Florida. And it was like, you know, hell day yesterday. And you're asking me now if I want to go to this thing. He goes, why don't we just hang out all day? Why don't we just go downtown in New Orleans? So I thought, I'd rather do that too. So we did. We just went and did the tourist thing, you know, went down and had, you know, oysters at Felix's and did all the stuff. Up and I don't know, probably around three or four, he said, hey, let's go to the Roosevelt Hotel. And we just sat there and talked, just talked about everything. And he, and he made this statement, I'll never forget. He looked me in the eye and he goes, so when are you going to birth this baby you're carrying around? And I said, what do you mean by that? And he goes, you know what I mean about that. Whole tones and this whole frequency thing. He goes, it could change the world, you know. I said, I'll get around to it someday. And he goes, nope, today is that day. <laughs> and he got a, a napkin from, from the bar. And wrote out, you know, his idea of what an agreement could look like between the two of us, and that was how we birthed whole tones that day. Wow, it's a business. That's amazing. Yeah. So then, the production of it after yeah. that became the production. Yep. So how did that work? Actually, uh, um, well, you know, I mean, obviously, you're great at what you do. I'm enjoying it. So you're great at what you do. And I'm really, really good at what I do until whole tones. So all these years, you know, you get a Grammy. You don't get a Grammy because you're no good. You get a Grammy because you work hard and other people thought it was worth it. And uh, so as a producer, engineer, musician, composer, you know, I write for, I can score an orchestra, I can do a soundtrack, or I can do a, you know, a three-piece jazz ensemble. It doesn't really matter. I was pretty good at it. So when it came to whole tones, though, there wasn't any, you know, I think this is really going to help somebody listening. I, I feel it. I, I had a way that I did things. I had a system. And my system worked really well for me until 
I got about 10 miles from the studio. My wife was driving, had all my gear in the back of the truck, and we're getting to the studio, and all of a sudden I break down. I mean, just emotional. She goes, what's wrong? I said, I don't have any music. I don't have any lead sheets. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And this guy's in that building waiting for direction, and I don't know what I'm doing. She goes, but you know that, that the theory and the tones in your head are real. I said, yeah. And she goes, that's all, all you're going to need. And so I walk in the studio, and here's these monster musicians, you know, with their little egg timers as soon as, you know, <laughs> we start, you know. And, and I just told them right away, I said, you're all getting paid right now. You don't need your egg timer. You know, it starts now. And I said, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I broke down. I just started crying. And I got down, I sat down on the floor, and I said, I'm going to put the headphones on, and I'm going to listen to the tones I created. And there's music in there. It's like a well, and I'm going to go in and get the music and when I hear it I'm going to start shouting I'm going to shout parts out to you right away and I want you to get on your instrument and I want you to start playing along with what I'm doing when I'm singing to you and I want you to remember it and then when I tell you the red light's going to come on and we're going to record this thing so here's what makes it even more exciting for your listeners this particular studio was called Noise Vault Studios it had no windows and only isolation booths meaning that I'm in a room Drummers in a room, keyboard players in a room, bass players Everyone's in a room. separate. Everybody's separate without line of sight. Can't see them at all. So, and I don't have a I don't have a watch on either. So I can't hear them. All I can do, the only way I can hear their music is back through the cans in there. But I since I'm mic'd up, you know, I obviously can't speak into my microphone or it's going to print along with the guitar. So, it's it's kind of a live, live without a net experience. And so I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was thinking about, I've heard what we're going to do. And the first one that went down was 396. And so I just said, listen, I'm just going to start playing. I just played one chord. And then for 22 minutes and 22 seconds on the clock tick, we went into something that all I know is that when we were done, I see a very stoic, very unemotional engineer jumping up and down in the in the in the uh, mixing booth, going out of his mind. And he goes, "You guys need to come in here right now." So he went in there and he goes, "You know that was exactly 22 minutes and 22 seconds." And and he goes, "I got to play you some of this." And I listened back to it, and it sounded like symphonic music. It sounded like something I would normally compose, but much much better. <laughs> and but no, this was spontaneous. I mean, without seeing each other or, or having any type of, of signals. or I mean, the drummer knew when to come in, when to come out, when to stop dead, when to start back up, and everybody followed everything. And I thought, if, if we can do that six more times, this is going to be life-changing. And, and that's how it went down. The whole thing mixed and out the door was seven days. Wow. And it was all one take spontaneous music with nobody being able to see each other and no music in front of anybody. It was just, and it's always been that way. These guys, that's why I only play with the guys I play with. They're so intuitive and they know me so well. And they're such wonderful men of God. They feel things and they know what's going on. And I don't have to tell them much. You know, I usually have an explanation of what's in my heart before. And then we go in there, and we just start playing. So. so, Michael, now you have it, and now you want to bring it to the world, right? So how do you get it out okay. to okay. the masses? Well, so here's the funny thing is that, you know, again, um, PR and, uh, in, and and marketing and all that, like, that's not my strong side. My strong side is I'm a pure creative. I'm like an 80-20, like 20 ad admin and 80%, you know, dreaming and creating. So, uh you know, Joe's group, I, I really didn't know a whole lot about what Joe did. It. I'd never heard of him before. I just became his buddy, you know, and then I realized, yeah, this is pretty cool stuff. Well, I went to California and San Diego at this TNC thing that we're going to, you know, next week. Or, and, uh, and, I, and people started saying, so we hear you're working with Joe. Boy, how did that happen? He's amazing. And everybody said wonderful things about Joe. I mean, everybody. And so... Um, you know, when we were releasing it, it, it got it got a little heated at some points because I have expectations and it looked like it was going to miss the, the original um, Black Friday. And I'm a pretty, as you can tell, I'm a pretty laid back guy, but I barked 
out some stuff over the phone and I said, listen, <laughs> you guys, you guys don't have this thing up and running by Black Friday. We got big problems. The next thing I looked on Slack and I see Joe going, all hands on deck, all hands on deck. And, and they, uh, this team of guys, there's not another group of people on the, the chemistry um, on the Barton Publishing team. I love every one of them. We're all friends. And they rose to the occasion and they blew that thing out on on Black Friday and the rest is history. And it's so, yeah, I mean, I'm it's like it's the old adage in business. I make he he selly. <laughs> That's about as difficult as it is. Michael, thank you for sharing the stories. I appreciate it. Um, I have two last questions. Um, but sure. before I ask them, let's point people to some of the sites that they should check sure. out. So we have wholetones.com, you know, W-H-O-L-E tones.com. Where else should we point people towards to check out uh, the work? Sure. Wholetonesmusic.com, spelled the same way, W-H-O-L-E-T-O-N-E-S-M-U-S-I-C.com. Mm -hmm. And for the newest project, which is called Life, Love, and Lullabies, which hopefully you and I will get to talk again. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's wholetonessleep.com. And that'll be a fun, maybe our next time we can talk about that because you'll, you'll be laughing the whole time how that came about. But that's the new one that just came out, Whole Tones, uh, Life, Love, and Lullabies. I was talking a little bit with Marty about this, and he said people were demanding this type of thing. And that's... Well, here's the funny thing. It's like usually, you know, I'm like... Like, you, like because people demand stuff doesn't really have any bearing on me but the fact that our no it doesn't no you know i know that's it's funny it's yeah. just so funny it's like i demand like, that you do this well i demand that i do what i'm supposed to do but but the thing was that i had already in my heart thought you know i didn't create whole tones the original one as a sleep project i recorded it as an utterance of what was supposed to be released so right. you know people would say 396 puts me to sleep and it's awesome but then if i listen through all night long the 852 comes in with all the drums and the electric guitar and wakes me up and i said well for starters just loop three 396 put that on an infinite loop and, <laughs> right, you'll, right. and, it, and that works your problem solved yeah yeah to some degree yeah what but when uh when I had the feeling of this lullaby thing, it was like, this is lullabies, but this isn't just for infants. This is for, this is from like nine months to 99 years. It's, you know, this is going to be something special. And I felt like I wasn't supposed to have any drums or percussion or any, um, even though, of course, because the, the musicians have such great meter, you could still use a metronome if you wanted. But I didn't feel like there needed to be any dynamics or transient points in the music or anything that was percussive that, you know, so people could rest. I had no idea what I had created. Wasn't even in this thing is so powerful. I'll just tell you one quick story. We're in the recording studio, and I'm mixing down with with Brad Knight, the guy that I work with, producer, engineer, monster guy in the new place in Dallas called the Bakery, and uh, where we did the last two, and um, and we're we're pounding coffees, pounding them. I mean, I drink one cup. I'm on my fourth cup, and then we went out to get iced coffee because we can't stay awake. And we're like, we still got four more hours of mixing and going. I'm looking at him, and he's like, and I'm I'm nodding out. And finally, I looked at him, and I just lost it. I said, "You goober, we're the reason we're falling asleep because we're mixing lullabies. This stuff actually works." <laughs> <laughs> it was putting us to sleep. That's so, funny. Yeah. That's great. Um, so two last questions, Michael. Um, one is. I want to hear about uh, a low point and then uh, a proud moment. And I don't know if this was a low point, but I was reading that one of your, you had a really difficult old job um, at Rent-A-Center. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man, you really did. Good. You, you did some research. Yeah. So you mean as far as in my life, like low points and high yeah. points? Yeah. Or... Well, I would say that, um, again, it's so funny, isn't it, how, how you can always find something good later on, usually. It's usually 2020, but um, it, it, retroactive. Uh, the Rena Center was definitely a low point because it was like, you know, that whole time of like you feeling like an invisible man, you know that you have skill, you know you're talented, but you're 
you can't get arrested in the music industry at the moment and you're cleaning out cruddy, moldy refrigerators. And the worst part of all was when they moved me into the repo division and I'm like taking kids' TVs on Saturday during cartoons and I like, uh, like, I, I I was so bad at it that usually I'd I'd tell the dad I'd say I'll be back at two when the cartoons over I can't do it I just can't do it you know so yeah I think that was a low you point. You'd have to go in and repossess items because someone couldn't pay the the bill because they something. wouldn't pay the bill and half yeah. the time I wish I had the money so I could buy it for him and so it was a very tough job I was not in my wheelhouse at yeah. all and then um, a high point uh, would absolutely be. Um, Whole tones for a myriad of reasons. I mean, first of all, because like the main main thing I missed was as hard as I tried all my life and with as much research and schooling I had as a musician, the only time in my whole life where I didn't know what I was doing and I was able just to get out of God's way and just let this intention and this intuition take over and do what I felt like was supposed to happen is the only time it ever really, really blew up. I just found that fascinating mm. that it took me 54 years of life to realize some of the elemental secrets of life is mm. to get out of the way and stop thinking that you know how everything I did the same thing all the time and I had a moderate level of success. And in That's the case tough of rent, to do though. It's, it's super hard. Yeah. But if you can do it, I mean, what do you got to lose? That's the point. And then and you know, of course, um you know, my family changed, you know, Joe Barton and all the guys came into my life. It, yeah, so this last few years has definitely been, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Michael, I want to be the first one to thank you so much. I am looking forward to hanging out in person, hopefully, uh, in San Diego. And everyone yeah. should check out wholetones.com, wholetonesmusic.com. Thank you so much. Oh, bro, thank you, man. Yeah. Yeah, let's do this again. Yes. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand